This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. Thank you for joining us. With me today is Richard Fields. Justin Amash has jumped into the uh, Libertarian Party presidential race kind of last minute and kind of upset the apple cart. And as usual, you get the political talking head saying how he's going to ruin the race for one side or win the race for the other. As we all get three votes again, I suppose. Uh, no, I, I think I think I, I support Justin Amash. I am incredibly happy to see that uh, a mainstream politician with uh, excellent libertarian credentials and a track record of voting libertarian on pretty much everything over the last, I think it's 10 years. I am delighted to see that he's changed his registration to Libertarian. He is our first Libertarian uh, representative uh, in Congress. I think I think it's a, it's a tremendous vote of confidence on his part uh, for the Libertarian Party, and I am delighted to see that he's entered the fray. Yeah, it's from a from a Libertarian perspective, and from a, the public has to see that the, our presidential candidate has the theoretical ability to, to lead in the job, right? And that's kind of the most the problem with the, the most of our candidates is the public won't see them as viable. But Justin Amash will be seen as viable, which is I think is why they're so upset that, oh, you're going to cost us the election. Both sides are saying he's going to cost us the election. We get this every time we have a viable candidate. We certainly hope so. Yeah, we, we do. We hope they cost them both the election and we get to win. But, you know, that's not really a... a well, no, I, no, Justin Amash says, I'm in this to win, and I believe him. And, you know, stranger things have happened. Yeah, Trump got elected. Um, this whole coronavirus, the whole world is up in arms now. Who knows where all this politics is going to end up, how this is going to play out in six months or in, in the politi political frame. I don't even know, right? I'm sitting here running my own little race, and I have no clue. We're just making stuff up as we go along. I think, <laughs> I think that's kind of the whole deal. But I, it's, it's this strange conversation we have every year about how somehow votes are owed to Republicans or Democrats. And if a Libertarian or, or Jesse Ventura now, I guess, is running for the Green Party, is somehow they're going to take votes from somebody else. They're going to steal votes. It's, that's a whole concept that I just don't can't wrap my head around. Well, I mean, it's a concept that's being pushed by Democrats and Republicans who think they own the country. And of course, they don't. The people own the country. And, uh, you know, it's to be expected that Democrats and Republicans are going to uh, be up in arms, uh, absolutely rejecting any kind of competition to their duopoly. And if you take a look at the policies of Democrats and Republicans, the substance of the policies is pretty close to the same. Both are against immigration. Both are uh, against trade. Uh, in, in anything other than a way that benefits large corporations. Both are uh, enthrall to large corporate power. Uh, you know, go down the list of issues, there's not a whole lot of difference other than the uh, symbolic issues, things that to get people's emotions riled up like abortion and that sort of thing. Those are the issues that keep people divided uh, when the economic issues should have it be us against the establishment. The establishment of the Democrats and Republicans, and that's what uh, I, th I hope Justin Amash or whoever gets elected uh, selected by the uh, Libertarians. I hope that's the message that they'll be able to uh, put forward, and it'll be a difficult message to do. So we need somebody that is both articulate and correct. I think Amash is both. Yeah, well, I'm I'm excited that we actually have somebody that the media will take at least seriously again, right? If that's all my biggest fear is if one of these other candidates had gotten in, the media simply ignores them. And at least this way, they're kind of forced to kind of have a conversation. And so at least we get in the conversation this way. And yeah. which is something we don't, we wouldn't get with, you know, as, as much as I like someone like Adam Kokesh or even Berman Supreme, they're not going to get part of the conversation, the national conversation. They're just it's not going to be allowed in. Well, yeah, Amash, I looked at with, uh, with reason. And uh, uh, he's being, he of course is a, a political satirist that wears uh, an overture on his head. And, but he's a, he's a serious libertarian as well. And he said, I support the, the Amish, spelled with an I. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can say that even Vermin Supreme supports the Amish, not of course Amash because he's running against it. Yeah, it's, it's, we live in a strange time. Um, but this actually brings us to a, a inter interesting uh, bit about the Libertarian Party convention itself. How the convention is now kind of up in arms. The party itself has delayed the convention, I guess, to make a decision about whether they have an in-person convention or a or an online convention. 
it's all kind of thrown up in the air, but it's kind of an unofficial spokesman of the Libertarian Poor People's Caucus. It all seems like a bunch of, you know, elitists kind of arguing with each other. Why don't our votes matter? You know, would this would would a Justin Amash jumping in late even matter if we had a vote if the primaries actually made the difference? Well, you're asking why uh, the Libertarian Party. Uh, I mean, the the, base, the the underlying question is why Libertarians select by uh, a convention delegates going to a convention as opposed to uh, by the primary system. Well, I guess it's a bigger it's a, it's a deeper issue. When this party was nice and small, when you were a small party, it made sense, right? It, it didn't make sense to have the the wider thing. But we're now fifty state party, and so we we have primaries in fifty states. But essentially, your votes are meaningless. It's yeah, just, no, they're, they're they're beauty contest primaries. Uh, a lot of uh, I don't know if they if they if the Democrats and Republicans still have beauty contest primary. Well, it's it, it, certainly was, it certainly was a thing in the past. Uh, you know the the Libertarian Party uh, 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 bylaws and so a way of selecting a presidential candidate, and that way is by uh, delegates being elected by the state conventions, and those delegates going to the national convention and voting for their presidential election. There's nothing wrong with that process as long as the process is respected. The whole coronavirus uh, shutdown, of course, is thrown. A monkey a wrench into the works by uh, making the the the, the uh, reality of, a, of an in-person convention uh, difficult, if not uh, impossible. Not because not because of any fa any fault of the Libertarian Party or the Libertarian National Committee or anybody anybody any other Libertarian. It's it's the fault essentially uh, causing a a, a a shutdown of the economy for nefarious or fearful take your pick or probably both reasons yeah i'm just wondering if maybe it's an opportunity for us to have a wider discussion because as a as someone on the lower economic scale going to the convention is simply impossible so it's so the whole presidential election process is kind of not relevant to me right? i mean i can't have a bully pulpit i can sit here and i can talk to the people who might be delegates but i have no essential say because mm -hmm. i can't get to any convention and you, my people would say that an online convention could solve that. You know, poor people can maybe be able to participate in an online convention theoretically down the line because delegates are already decided at this point. But, but even still, we can't organize a state fair booth properly, and I have little faith that we can organize an online convention that will actually function. And, and so, I don't know how we solve this except with maybe over time converting the Libertarian Party to a caucus system or to a or to a primary system that actually works, and then we don't have to worry about latecomers jumping in. There's a lot of people who are, who are upset about Justin Amash jumping into the libertarian race so late. And well, if we actually had a real primary system, we wouldn't have to worry about people jumping in late. Well, that's true. Uh, and I mean, there's nothing wrong with changing the process. And uh, I mean, you're saying that you don't have a say because you're, you're not uh, able to fly to Austin. Oh, and that, and that's, that's a fair comment. But you do have the ability probably to go to the state convention and select delegates, uh, somebody who agrees with your, uh, your candidate uh, preference. Um, well, I, I, I didn't get to this year again because of economics, but you know, last minute I didn't, I thought I was going to get to go, but there's a lot of people who don't go to the, I, I, I talked to them. They don't go because they can't afford to go. They can't afford to take three days off to go down to LA or even when it was in Concord, you know, it's, it's hard to take three days off to take, to go to Concord because you're a janitor working at nights and you're, and so you're you're right. Right. You do the state convention as well as the national convention. Yeah. And, yeah. and now the state convention is, you know, it is what it is. You have to kind of deal with it. You, people accept that. But at the national convention, when you're talking about a presidential election and you're talking about, you know, the the, the group of voters we're going to have to start talking to are the core group of voters, the uncomfortable voters. Those are the groups where we're going to get most of our votes in the future coming to. But we kind of have disconnected them from our election process, at least the presidential level anyway. And I think maybe there's a marketing argument to get down in and find a way to get them engaged. Well, yeah, certainly, uh, pri you know, going to a primary, you know, using a primary system as opposed to uh, a delegate uh, delegate selected by state conventions, which is what we have now. Certainly, that would be a way of getting uh, more grass level uh, support for whoever the candidate ends up being. Yeah, I was actually thinking maybe caucuses might actually be best because then you can actually get them at the county level. You can still have that grassroots kind of communication that you know where you get face to face communication without while still getting the um, the 
the wider process. You, I've, yeah. I've, I've kind of lost my thought, but I think you know what I'm trying to get to. Well, yeah, and I'm not sure uh, if that's something that's within the party's control or not. I know that uh, some states, obviously, obviously uh, Iowa, Nevada, have caucuses, uh, but I don't know whether the parties just determine whether that's the uh, selection process or whether the state government uh, determines that. So that's a question. I, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. But if it is, in fact, the uh, state government, then it's sort of out of control. Yeah, it's one of these questions. But I think this is an opportunity for us to start, start having these kind of wider discussions about you no, know, how the party operates, because we're no longer the small little party, right? We're going to be a big, if we want to be the third major party, we have to, time, time, might be time to figure out how to start acting like it. Yeah. Okay. All right, it's just kind of my question about the, you know, it's maybe it's time for us to think about instead of being kind of the elitist party, because I saw an article in the, a study had done, somebody had done a study, I forget where it was, that the Libertarian Party platform is completely disconnected from the Libertarian Party voters. That there's, there's well, a disconnect. Yeah, I mean, yes and no. I mean, again, the Libertarian Party flat platform. There's a state platform and there's a national platform. The state platform is, is uh, uh, put together by libertarians who are interested in sitting in committee meetings and, you know, debating, uh, you know, the the uh, phraseology of the platform and what should be included and what should not be included. It's a mind-boggling, boring process. For no, yes, trust me. I was on the platform yeah. committee for California this year. Yeah, trust me. I, I'm well aware of the process. It's, it's, yeah. it's amazing. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> and and the grudge for most people but the people who are very much in who are very uh, you know very interested in making sure that their pet uh, ideas go into the platform they go to the platform committee meetings and and write the platform uh and then of course the national platform is entirely different or isn't it's, it's, it's entirely different process because there it's uh, put together by delegates to the national convention who are in turn selected by uh, delegates to the state convention and they're similar but not not exactly the same uh certainly uh, in scope they're not the same the california platform uh at least the last one i saw is a lot in the national platform uh but I'm, I'm not sure how important platforms are anyway for the simple reason that you know, if you look at the democratic plat platform or the republican platform they're ignored by politicians in all but uh, in all but form, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, they talk the talk during the campaign. But when uh, it comes time to governing, they ignore the platforms entirely. Both parties do. Yeah, the platform from a practical yeah, sense. That would be a, that would be a fear uh, on the part of uh, on my part that we would ignore the platform were we to elect libertarians. Hopefully that's a long, that's a problem that's a long ways down the road. Yeah, well, not, not electing libertarians, but libertarians <laughs> being elected to ignore the platform. Yeah, well, the, the platform as it's, well, the California platform is a complicated mess, and I gave up trying to even read it. And that's why, why I was on the committee, trying to make it understandable, but that's a whole nother issue. Um, is to put the platform itself, I think you're right. The, the, Liber the Republicans and Democrat platforms are essentially relevant to everybody but activists, right? It's essentially, I call it activist porn. It's activist stuff for activists to do, keep, keep activists busy. But yeah. the libertarian platform actually is different because people actually do go out and look at it. Uh, people no. who are not libertarians actually do look at it and do read it because we're trying to figure out what the heck we are. Yeah, and I think the reason for that is is uh, libertarians don't get the the kind of mainstream uh, some libertarians uh, get. So if people uh, who think they are libertarian want to you know want to find out what what the heck is this LP thing all about, that's kind of the go to place to find out because you're not going to find a good. Uh, even-handed fair analysis if you go to the websites of, of uh, CNN or the Wall Street Journal or uh, Washington Post or NBC or the New York Times. They're, they're not going to have anything other than their, uh, their uh, uh, biased take on what they think we are, which is going to be a character of what we actually are. Yeah, well, I like to say libertarian is more of a philosophy than an ideology. And so each one of us kind of gets to interpret it on our own. So each one of us kind of gets our own platform. And, and yeah. so and so our the party platform is kind of a an amalgamation of everybody individual platform kind of thrown in and tossed out what's less popular. That's that's kind of the way I view the, the at least the California platform, right? It, because it doesn't make any other sense otherwise. I can't wrap my head around it any other way than that, because there's no 
It doesn't have any, I don't know, combined narrative. It's just like a bunch of rocks thrown against the wall and see what's stuck. But if you but if you look at it as a philosophy and you kind of understand, okay, that then it makes sense because everybody has their own interpretations. You go into a room, you argue, and what's left over is kind of what the platform is. Yeah. And so and that, and that effectively is the process. It's, you know, everybody everybody has their hobby horse and and uh, you know it's it's the uh, the old uh, smoke filled room uh, analogy. People go into uh, a uh, meeting room and uh, I'll uh, support your plank if you support my plank, and that kind of uh, horse running, I think, goes on. Yeah, and which okay, which one do you care about? That, that's, about? that's just what happens. Yeah, well, it's politics. It's essentially it's it happens. You know, I've got this law. I want to I want to make my I want to fill my potholes in my street. And well, I want to fill my potholes in my street. Hey, let's get together. We'll both agree to fill potholes, right? <laughs> you know whatever it is, but I need my tree taken down. Hey, fine. We need your vote. We'll take your tree down. If you help fill our potholes and everybody's fine, everybody's happy. Yeah. yeah. And so that's kind of the whole way politics works, but it doesn't happen. Um, what visibly anymore. I think we used to kind of know you could actually <laughs> go down and watch. You didn't have to, but you could. And now you can't, I think is kind of oh, where yeah. I mean, if you're talking about politics, real politics. At the national yeah. level in particular. And at the state level too, in California and, and most of the, larger states, what's really happening is the policy is being written by uh, K Street lobbyists who uh, they literally, actually, or people who have just come from K Street and are, and are now uh, staffers in Congress, there's a revolving door there. Those are the people who actually draft the legislation. It's not Senator Foghorn that's sitting down and writing uh, out laws. It's his aides, and his aides are either freshly from K Street or are hiring it out to K Street, and it's and it's the you know the biggest donors who actually draft the laws, and the uh, senator or the representative will say, yeah, it looks good as long as I get I get your support come uh, campaign donation time. Yeah, there's essentially I figured, I find out I'm talking to some people who work in the legislative on the bureaucratic side, and there's two ways essentially laws get written. There's there's the the bureaucrats either write a law, or the the uh, Oh, the lobbyists. Yeah, the lobbyists. The lobbyists yeah. write a law. It's either the lobbyists yeah. or the bureaucrat. It's one well, of the two. Yeah. I mean, there's another level to it too, which is administrative law, which is a huge, huge problem, particularly at the federal level. Uh, that's where Congress says, uh, you know what? Eradicating poverty would be a good thing. Let's write a law that says let's eradicate poverty. We will support. You know, we will create uh, an eradicate poverty administration. We'll call it the whatever EPA. Well, that's not very good. That's already taken. But anyway, we'll, we'll you know create an agency that does that, and we'll give the agency the power to write rules and regulations and uh, procedures and so forth to eradicate poverty. And then you have uh, the Congress, in, in effect, in effect, does then is they delegate the writing of law to bureaucrats, and the bureaucrats, uh, like all bureaucracies, they're primary function is to stay, you know, to keep their jobs, to, you know, to, to grow their uh, fiefdom and to continue to operate. Uh, we see that all the time with, with the, uh, you know, with the uh, ballooning effects of administrative law. And then, of course, the problem, the, the you know, added problem to that is these administrative rules and regulations, they don't call them laws, they call them rules and regs. They are, uh, the, the, the agency becomes the, uh, the, uh, the writer, the, the legislator and the the you know the ju the judge and the jury on whether or not somebody is following those uh, regulations. So in other words, if you uh, write a regulation that uh, if a regulation is written that affects somebody uh, in a bad way, uh, environmental regulations are a, a good a, a good example of that. If a regulation says you can't use your land because uh, we think that uh, a uh, oh I don't know a, a body of water ten miles away might be affected by the way that you're you know doing your irrigation project it's, it's up to you to prove no it doesn't and you have to make your case to the agency that wrote the law the agency that wrote the law is obviously going to rule against you and then you have to you know take it into either state or federal court usually federal court and then federal court has uh, a, 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 a there's a long-term standing precedent that says we give agencies the uh, benefit of the doubt and so you end up with agencies making up the rules as they go along, enforcing the rules, and then judging whether or not people that violate the rules are guilty. And the answer is always, yeah, you're guilty. 
So, it, so it's it's a huge problem, and it's mainly a problem because Congress has delegated rulemaking, so they don't have to uh, uh, take the heat themselves. They can say, well, that is not our fault, it's that agency's fault. Yeah, well, and is it even a bit more nefarious than that? We have Governor Newsom the other day said didn't want to let uh, the cor coronavirus, as, you know, he wanted to, uh, as an opportunity to reimagine a more progressive era. So, <laughs> so now we've got politicians using the coronavirus crisis as a way to use essentially your process, the process you just described, to get in their ideology, essentially, to their version of what society should look like. Yeah, a good crisis. Never waste, never waste a good crisis. Is the uh, is the is the oft repeated uh, uh, phrase. Uh, a guy, which is Emmanuel, I forget his last name, uh, said it in the Obama administration when he was an AG. Now he's mayor of a uh, mayor of Chicago, or was yeah, Rahm Emanuel. And, uh, yeah, yeah, and and the guy, I think the guy that originally said it was Winston Churchill, if, I, if his memory serves. Uh, you know, and 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 it's true. If you have a crisis, you can push all kinds of. Uh, junk through the legislative process. The Patriot Act was a perfect example of that. It was uh, legislation that was all drafted and all ready to go, just waiting for an emergency to push it through. Never would have went through under normal uh, circumstances, but was easy to get through when everybody was afraid that the uh, that the you know the terrorists were going to get were come at, you know going to come and kill us all. Likewise, now that everybody's afraid that this little virus is going to come and kill us all. Everybody is willing to roll over and accept things that they would never accept otherwise. We are essentially operating right now, operating under martial law, shelter in place. You can't go out uh, unless you wear a mask and you can't go out, you know, in some places hardly at all unless it's to the supermarket or the drugstore. That's, that's you know, has all of the, the aspects, all of the uh, forms of martial law, and we're accepting it. The American people are saying, 80% or, or more are saying, yeah, that's fine, I'll do my part. It's based in fear, the fear of being uh, killed. And, and you know, it, there's, some, there's some justifiable fear there. The fear is that, well, this is a, a virus that is a little bit more contagious than the ordinary uh, uh, virus. And it's also probably got a slightly higher death rate than the ordinary virus but it doesn't justify a total shutdown of the economy. And with a total shutdown of the economy, you can you can wreak, wreak all kinds of mayhem. We're seeing a, a, a expansion of federal debt, uh, of uh, monetary authority and monetary expansion that is totally unprecedented in this country and in the world. We are sowing the seeds for becoming first a Japanese deflationary situation with the economic shutdown, and later on in Argentina or Zimbabwe or, or Venezuelan inflationary situation where rule of law will essentially uh, have the, be in danger of breaking down altogether. Well, we actually see the rule of law type breaking down altogether anyway. There was a picture on a beach of, a, of, the, of the, oh, the Coast Guard, not the Coast Guard, the lifeguards driving down the beach telling people to, to get off the beach. The beach is closed and everybody's just waving at the guy. But they're still sitting there on their towels. No one was moving. Yeah. So, they're, so they're not, they're already starting to just kind of ignore the rules. They say, oh, forget it. I'm not going inside anymore. What are you going to do? You're, you're letting out criminals so we can put people sitting on the beach in jail. So no, we're just going to sit here and <laughs> we're not taking this anymore. They kind of, a lot of people uh, yeah, just say no. I live, I live in Yolo County, which is a very liberal county. Uh, I mean, we're, I mean, Ivan Davis, People's Republic of Davis, and uh, we have a rule in Davis, you know, handed down by the, I guess, the County Board of Supervisors saying you have to wear a mask anytime you're outside. Uh, I, I, you know, I go for walks, uh, you know, long walks, uh, five, four or five mile walks every day. And just as a, a matter of curiosity, I counted the number of people who were actually wearing masks, and it was 2%. 2% of the people that I met walking down the green box in Davis were wearing masks. So even in the most liberal, the most uh, politically correct jurisdiction, probably in the state of California, outside of Marin County, people are ignoring the, the uh, in practice, people are ignoring. Yeah, and the, the whole mask thing is, I was listening to a, uh, oh, the lady on Facebook, there was a lady who on Facebook who was interviewing some medical professional and they were talking about how walking down the street, especially on a warm summer day, it's essentially impossible to catch the virus in the air. So there's been no no documented case of airborne, ex when you're outside, airborne transmission of the virus. It's essentially impossible. 
especially on a nice warm summer day to catch the virus walking by somebody or sitting on the beach. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that impossible is, you know, never say never. I'm not sure impossible is the right word. I'm not sure virtually impossible. Yeah. <laughs> In your face, you're going to pick up a little bit of uh, a virus. And obviously, you know, if I'm, in a situation where I'm going to be sneezing, I'll either put the mask on or I'll, you know, make myself not six feet away, but, uh, you know, 20 feet away from the nearest person. I'm, I respect the, the rights of people not to be infected by me if I'm infected. And I uh, agree with the, uh, with the, the, a similar right. You know, there's no, we have no infer- inherent right to infect others if we're, if we're infected or if we've been, even if, even if we've been exposed. The correct procedure to uh, this whole coronavirus thing would have been to, like other countries did, have widespread testing. We have essentially no testing. I came back from uh, India, uh, from a from a, a hot spot of coronavirus back in in March, and I tried to get. I flew originally into Southern California, uh, talked to the Orange County Department of uh, Public Health. They refused to g- give me a test. Talk to my doctor's uh, medical group. They refused to give me a test. Talk to the uh, Sacramento um, testing site out at uh, out at the uh, uh, fairgrounds, uh, Cal Expo. They refused to give me a test. All of them eligible for a test with a phone interview, even though I'm at 72 in a dangerous, you know, a susceptible age group. Even though I, when I first started these conversations, I had a cough probably from a cold, but I could have had coronavirus for all I know. I don't know. I'll, I'll probably never know unless I get an antibody test. Well, and doctor, even that, those antibody tests are 30%, 30% inaccurate, they said. So uh, yeah, I hear they're 5% interact, in, in, inaccurate, but yeah. nonetheless, that's that's not a very good, that's not a very, even 5% means that, you know, <laughs> yeah. Very, yeah, that's whether you're infected or were infected or not. So the, the, the point is, even a thermometer, I mean, Yeah, it's if you, just, if, you have, if you have a temperature, you're quarantined for 14 days. If you don't, you're free to go. That would have been a, a task that any uh, anybody could have done. Doctors up in Washington State had a, had a, put together, you know, invented a test and started using it. And from all I've heard, it was an effective test. CDC, a bunch of you know lifer uh, civil service bureaucrats that can't get fired. They said, no, wasn't invented here. You can't use that test. Cease and desist. It's crazy uh, what we, uh, the way we approach it. The way to do it is you have a test. You quarantine those who are at risk, those with, who are aged, those who have medical conditions that are aggravated by coronavirus, and those who have been exposed. Those, you, those people you quarantine. Everybody else, go about your business. They didn't and, do that. No, and that, we're going to have to end it on that. I want to thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, you can... Catch us on libertariancounterpoint.com. Thank you for watching us on YouTube. Press all the social media buttons. Richard, thank you for coming. Thank you, Access Sacramento, for having Libertarian Counterpoint on for, what, 29 years running. And we will see you all next week. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.